The year 1993 brought us a lot of great things. In the world of television, we saw season one of Frasier. In film, True Romance first hit theaters. And in the WWF, we saw a roller coaster year full of highs and lows. Yes, if 1992 was the year where the last dying embers of the Hulkamania era were supposed to have burnt out, the 1993 was supposed to represent the shift into a new generation for WWF. And while in many ways this would happen, with smaller, more athletic stars solidifying their spot on top of the card and new weekly TV shows making their debut, sometimes letting go of the past is a hard thing to do. But how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire story from start to finish in The WWF in 1993, A Year in Review. When we last left off, a new WWF champion had been crowned in the form of Bret Hitman Hart, someone who, with his ability to put on a different, more technical style of match to what fans were used to, had been able to capture fans' hearts in the wake of the loss of prior big names like Hulk Hogan, The Ultimate Warrior, Jake Roberts, The British Bulldog, and Sid Justice. And it wasn't long then before the company had started to adapt around their new top star with similar styles of matches, something that was double important now, as on January 11th, Vince McMahon would debut his latest creation, Monday Night Raw, a weekly TV show that would air on primetime from the Manhattan Center and which would break new ground for televised wrestling by offering more than mere squash matches. Instead, this one would regularly push storylines forward and would feature early classics such as Mr. Perfect and Ric Flair's Loser Leaves Town match, the very match that ended up being the Nature Boy's swan song to the company for the time being. It would also be the show that saw a huge return in the wake of an even huger loss just a month later, but before we would get there, the Royal Rumble would take place on January 24th. And as one of the more highly anticipated shows of the year by this point, WWF felt the need to load this card up, with it finally featuring the long-awaited showdown between Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty over the Intercontinental title. But of course, despite managing to keep his job for long enough to get the bout in the ring this time, in the end, HBK was on too much of a roll to be defeated on the night, with him hitting his rival with a super kick after just over 14 minutes to put the whole thing to bed. And as he was doing this, elsewhere on the card, the Steiner brothers were making their WWF pay-per-view debut a successful one when they picked up a win over the Beverly brothers, all while, in the WWF title picture, Bret Hart was racking up another title defense as he was able to get the better of his opponent, Razor Ramon. After that, fans would get introduced to another new face with Lex Luger, who had previously been employed by Vince McMahon's short-lived World Bodybuilding Federation, would make the jump back over to the world of wrestling when he was unveiled under the new gimmick name of The Narcissist by his manager going forward, Bobby Heenan. That said, the real main event of the night, though, was the 30-man Royal Rumble match where, this year, an added stipulation would see the winner get a shot at the WWF title in the main event of the upcoming WrestleMania, a stipulation which proved to be so popular that it would end up continuing on to the present day. So, with even more on the line than normal then, every contestant in the match gave it their all, hoping to book their shot against the Hitman at the Showcase of the Immortals. Despite some impressive efforts though, including a 1 hour, 1 minute and 10 second run from Bob Backlund and another dominating performance from The Undertaker, it would be Yokozuna who would come out the victor by the end, last eliminating Macho Man Randy Savage as he from there set his sights on taking down the champ in April. Yes, the WrestleMania world title picture seemed set, but as we mentioned before, a big return and an even bigger loss would come before then that would throw a spanner in the works as, on January 27th, the wrestling world would sadly say goodbye to one of its biggest stars, both literally and metaphorically, when the legendary Andre the Giant passed away at just 46 years old, his death ultimately coming as a result of congestive heart failure. So to honor the man who had done so much for the company then, later that year on March 22nd, Andre would become the inaugural inductee into the WWF Hall of Fame. Elsewhere though, the pain of this loss would be numbed somewhat for fans when, on the February 22nd episode of Raw, Hulk Hogan would make his return to the company, from there teaming up with his real-life friend Brutus the Barber Beefcake as the two got involved in a program with Money Inc. And this would lead to the biggest show of the year on April 4th where, in the parking lot of Caesars Palace on the Las Vegas Strip, 
WWF put on a show that was considered the worst WrestleMania ever by many at the time. Of course, being in such a small location compared to other years didn't help with this either, as with interest at an all-time low, the boss struggled to create any meaningful buzz around the show, even with the in-ring return of the Hulkster taking place. And part of the reason for this was that, for the most part, the card was pretty lacking, with Shawn Michaels having probably his worst WrestleMania match against Tatanka, all while elsewhere, Razor Ramon was handing Bob Backlund his first ever pinfall loss in WWF, Lex Luger was putting on an unimpressive performance against Mr. Perfect, and The Undertaker was continuing his undefeated streak with an absolute stinker disqualification victory over Giant Gonzalez. That's not to say that there weren't bright spots though, as the show did feature the debut of Jim Ross on commentary. And on top of that, Hulk Hogan would indeed make a successful return when he and Brutus Beefcake were able to get the upper hand on Money, Inc. But while this match took place on the undercard, coming out of the show, Hogan would remain the name on everyone's lips as, after Yokozuna was able to defeat Bret Hart to win the WWF title in the main event, the Hulkster would come out to challenge him to an impromptu match, from there, defeating the heel in just 22 seconds to start his fifth reign on top. Yes, it may have sent the crowd home happy on the night, but by the next day it was already clear how short-sighted of a move this had been, as not only had the Hitman and Yokozuna, two stars of the future, been sacrificed to make way for more Hulkamania, but Hogan was only planning on returning to the company on a short-time basis anyway, as with the steroid trial continuing to heat up and his movie career still burgeoning, he felt he couldn't commit full-time. So the plan initially then was for Hogan to drop the belt to the Hitman at the upcoming SummerSlam pay-per-view, putting the new generation over strong as he then moved on to other ventures. Before that could happen though, the Hulkster would have a change of heart, allegedly telling Brett that he was out of his league and that he would only drop the belt to Yokozuna instead, something which understandably left the Canadian feeling disrespected. Before that title change would happen, however, the five-time champion would take the belt over to Japan, where he would wrestle the at-the-time IWGP champion The Great Buddha in front of 55,000 fans at the Fukuoka Dome, there displaying a previously unseen level of technical in-ring skill that saw him wrestle in a catch-as-catch-can style. After the match, though, he would court controversy when he declared the WWF title to be nothing more than a toy, as what he really wanted was the IWGP title, something which didn't leave Vince McMahon happy back over in America. But he had his own problems to deal with at this point, because the WWF were on another tour of the UK, attempting to capitalize on their popularity there with an underwhelming show that saw Crush defeat Shawn Michaels and Lex Luger defeat Hacksaw Jim Duggan. And once back in the States, they would try to revive interest by having a number of title changes take place on house shows, attempting to sell audiences here on the fact that, if they went to a live show, then they might just see something special. Of course, none of these title changes would stand for long though as, after having defeated Shawn Michaels for the Intercontinental title on the May 17th episode of Raw, Marty Jannetty would end up dropping the belt right back at a house show on June 6th. All well, during the same period, the Steiner Brothers and Money Inc. would be trading the tag team titles back and forth as well. And all of these title changes would end up leading on to the next big pay-per-view of the year on June 13th, The King of the Ring. Yes, The King of the Ring had been a popular show on the live event circuit for years by this point, so hoping to turn it into a regular big show then, WWF would add it to their pay-per-view calendar, with the inaugural one seeing Bret Hart, Razor Ramon, Mr. Perfect, Mr. Hughes, Bam Bam Bigelow, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, Lex Luger, and Tatanka all fight it out in a single elimination one-night tournament. But while this was going on, elsewhere on the show, Shawn Michaels would be defending his newly regained Intercontinental title against Crush, while in the WWF title picture, Yokozuna and Hulk Hogan would have their long-awaited rematch, with this one seeing the heel eventually get the win and the title back after the Hulkster was temporarily blinded by Harvey Whippleman masquerading as a cameraman at ringside. Yes, if Brett couldn't be the one to beat him, at least Yoko had gotten the rub, as from there, Hogan would disappear from WWF TV for the next nine years, leaving the now two-time champ to tell the world that he had indeed killed Hulkamania. 
But if he thought he was going to have an easy time as champion going forward, he was dead wrong, because challengers were already lining themselves up, and none more so than the Hitman who, back in the King of the Ring tournament, would put on one of his career best performances when he had three very different and equally brilliant matches against Razor Ramon, Mr. Perfect, and Bam Bam Bigelow, defeating the latter in the finals to become the two-time King of the Ring. Unfortunately for him, though, any thoughts of returning to the WWF title picture would be temporarily sidelined when, as he was being coronated after the match, Hart would get interrupted by Jerry the King Waller, who, taking umbrage with the fact that he wasn't the only king in WWF anymore, would get in the hitman's face, all before laying him out with a scepter. And this would see the two spin off into a feud that would last for some time after that as, at one point, both Brett and his brother Owen would take the fight over to Lawler's home territory on the United States Wrestling Association. And they wouldn't be the only ones to do this either, because Vince McMahon himself would get in on things, making a few appearances in Memphis as a prototypical version of the later evil Mr. McMahon character he would so famously use as a foil for Steve Austin. Yes, it's strange to see full megalomaniacal heel boss Vince McMahon on display right there in 1993, but there it is regardless, and while few would have seen it at the time, it stands as an important historical moment as it allowed him to develop the character that would later help propel WWF towards previously unseen levels of success. Back in the WWF though, things would be heating up, as with Yokozuna now the WWF champion once more, and Bret Hart sidelined with other concerns, a new challenger was going to be needed. So that was why, on July 4th, a special event would be set up on the deck of the USS Intrepid, where Yokozuna and his manager Mr. Fuji laid out the challenge to anyone who wanted a shot, body slam the champion, and stake your claim to his belt. And of course, many would attempt to lift the foreign menace that afternoon, with both WWF performers and outside athletes trying and ultimately failing to do so in the end. Luckily then, just when all hope seemed lost, Lex Luger would arrive via a helicopter, from there making his way up to the champion and body slamming him with ease, something which came much to the delight of those on board. But wait, wasn't Lex Luger a narcissist heel? Well, yes, and as such, the whole babyface turn out of nowhere did come off as somewhat whiplash-inducing. That said, feeling like Hulk Hogan was now well and truly gone from the company, Vince McMahon had decided he needed to create a new American hero for audiences to get behind, and who better in his mind than the muscular Luger? So, setting off on a PR tour to win fans' hearts from there then, Lex would jump on board the Lex Express a tour bus that took him from state to state over the next few weeks as he shook some hands, kissed some babies, and staked his claim to being the number one contender for Yoko's title at the upcoming SummerSlam. And at one point it even seemed like Luger was going to be the man to beat the heel champion at the big show, from there starting his run as the new face of the company. That's certainly what he thought was going to happen, if you believe the rumors, that is, because as the story goes, prior to SummerSlam, he would get drunk at a bar and blab to a reporter about the planned finish of the big title match, with this then leaking out to the public and causing WWF to change course. Of course, others will argue that this wasn't true and that Vince McMahon had his own reasons for the finish he'd selected when the time came for SummerSlam on August 30th, but either way, come the end of that show, it was clear that something had shaken his faith in Luger as a top guy. Before we would get there though, the undercard would see the Steiner brothers once again defend their tag team titles against the Beverly brothers, well, elsewhere, in a match that had been brewing since WrestleMania 9, Shawn Michaels would pick up a countout win over Mr. Perfect, keeping the Intercontinental title around his waist in the process. On top of that, the 123 Kid would build on his historic win over Razor Ramon on an episode of Raw prior to this when he went up against Erwin R. Scheister. All well, pulling double duty for the night, Bret Hart would face off against both Doink the Clown and Jerry Lawler in separate matches, defeating the first with relative ease, all before then losing to the King immediately afterwards via disqualification. Yes, it wasn't quite the win over Hulk Hogan he'd initially been promised, but Bret would soldier through regardless, continuing to prove that, even if he wasn't in the main event, he was still the best and most over-wrestler on the roster regardless. 
but while his career was stalling, another's was on the rise, as Ludwig Borgo would make short work of Marty Jannetty, with him clearly being set up then to be another foreign menace challenger for Lex Luger after SummerSlam. And in terms of lengthy runs, things wouldn't fare much better for Giant Gonzalez because, fresh off the heels of his awful WrestleMania match against The Undertaker, the duo would return for round two on this show, with things not faring much better here as, after eight minutes and four seconds, the dead man would mercifully put the feud to bed once and for all, all while regaining the mystical urn that had been stolen from him prior to the bout. So after that stinker then, all hopes were on the main event to bring the show back up as, there, Lex Luger would finally get his chance to take on Yokozuna one-on-one -on -one with the WWF title on the line. That said, despite the obvious ending to this story being the American hero bringing the belt back for the good guys, this wouldn't happen. Sure, Luger would win, but only via countout, leaving him to then celebrate in the ring like an idiot as confetti and balloons rained from the ceiling and the roster of babyfaces lifted him up on their shoulders. Yes, the new Hulk Hogan didn't seem to realize that the title couldn't change hands on a countout and that he'd actually failed at his goal. Fans noticed, though, and while it would later come out that the plan was for the company to hold off until WrestleMania 10 for Lex's big coronation, after that night, the damage was already done and the moment passed, something which would be evident in his waning crowd reactions going forward. But Lex Luger's main event hopes weren't the only thing that came to a crushing end at SummerSlam that year, as the show would also mark the final WWF appearance as Ted DiBiase as an active wrestler. On top of that, Matt Osborne, the original portrayer of Doink the Clown, would see himself get fired soon after this too, as his drug problems spiraled out of control. And as if this wasn't enough, legendary interviewer Mean Gene Okerlund would make his exit around this point too, as he became one of the first big names to jump ship to WCW, a problem that would only get worse for WWF in the years that followed. Elsewhere, while well, that was happening, Shawn Michaels would be forced to vacate the Intercontinental title after he'd been suspended for failing a drug test. Following this, he would temporarily quit the company outright, as on the September 27th episode of Raw, Razor Ramon would end up being crowned the new champion after beating Rick Martel, with this starting a storyline that would climax in a very special match at the next year's WrestleMania, but we'll get there. In the meantime, WWF still had one big show to get through, and that would be November 24th Survivor Series where, this time, reverting back to the older formula, things would be made up mostly of multi-man elimination matches once again. But that's not to say there was nothing notable happening at the show as, in the opener, Diesel, the new hire who'd recently been brought in to act as the bodyguard of HBK, would make his in-ring debut in a match that saw him team with Erwin R. Scheister, Rick the Bottle Martel, and Adam Bomb to take on Razor Ramon, the 123 Kid, Marty Jannetty, and Mr. Perfect. Elsewhere, Bret Hart was supposed to continue his feud with Jerry Lawler in a match that saw the hitman and his brothers Owen, Bruce, and Keith take on the king in his court. Prior to the event, however, Lawler would be pulled after charges were leveled against him, charges he would later be exonerated of. In the meantime, though, the WWF would be able to coax Shawn Michaels back into the company as he took the king's place, teaming with three masked men to take on the hearts in what marked his and Brett's second meeting at the Survivor Series. And while the babyfaces would reign victorious come the end of this one, Owen would end up getting eliminated, with him being the only member of his family to do so, something which caused him to get frustrated as his brothers celebrated then, ultimately teasing where the story of him and the hitman was going. After that was done, a surprising bout would take place as, on a WWF pay-per-view, the Smoky Mountain Wrestling Tag Team Championships would be put on the line when the Heavenly Bodies took on the Rock and Roll Express. And while to a 1980s territory audience this may have felt like a big deal, to a WWF crowd in 1993 it unsurprisingly fell flat. So luckily, there was a bigger main event still to come, which would see Lex Luger, The Undertaker, and the Steiner Brothers take on Yokozuna, Ludwig Borga, and the Quebecers. Yes, at this point, Vince McMahon still believed that Lex could be his next big star, but with WrestleMania still four months away, he would use this match to segue Yoko off into a temporary program with The Undertaker instead as they battled to the back while the All-American hero got the pinfall over Borga so as to win the bout. But victory or not, it was clear that fans were no longer behind Luger. 
No, they were still all in on their real hero, Bret Hart, who would actually be challenged to a match by his brother Owen following the Survivor Series. Unwilling to fight his own flesh and blood, however, the hitman would refuse this, something which only caused things to get worse between the siblings as time went on. And while that wouldn't climax until 1994, 93 still did have a couple more notable events, as on December 13th at an All-American Wrestling show, the WWF women's title would be reactivated when Alundra Blaze defeated Heidi Lee Morgan to win the vacant title. In sadder news though, that month would also see the final WWF appearance of Bobby Heenan during this era as, after the December 4th episode of Raw, he'd also leave the company to go join WCW. Yes, whether Vince knew it or not, the Monday Night Wars were beginning to heat up, and while that was percolating, the steroid trial was drawing even closer too. On top of that, he had a new top babyface that fans just weren't getting behind, something which wasn't helping the continued waning fan interest in the product overall. What changes would he make in 1994? We'll find out in our next episode, but suffice to say, it would ultimately be the year where a new generation finally took hold completely. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.